Yeah, if you've got the keyboard right there, you can. Uh, Alex is my tech person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, okay. Well, anyway, it's, uh, it's good, good to be here tonight. Uh, my name is William Porter. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that my daughter, Kanye, was able to uh, accompany me tonight. And it's good to be here. And as Molly indicated, we met in some networking group. And uh, it's amazing. Anyway, what I would like to do tonight is tell you about um, what I do, uh, and um, as uh, Molly indicated, my name is William Porter, uh, and I'm an author, uh, but I haven't always been an author. Um, I spent most of my career as a college professor. I taught uh, geography, and uh, one thing about geography is that uh, the focus is on location and maps. And so what I did, I um, constructed, I constructed this map uh, going back to my days uh, working as a geographer. And uh, I found that my talents were not, uh, did not escape me as far as being able to construct, to construct a map. And this map is a simple map, but what it does, it, uh, it shows the, uh, as it says in the title, uh, North Carolina background cities. These are all of the places that are important to me as far as my personal uh, life as well as my professional life. And you can see that uh, the state of North Carolina with uh, the uh, print, uh, dark print being the cities, selected cities that are important and uh, the red dots indicate uh, the specific location of the cities. Now, I do have a PowerPoint presentation, and so I'll be going back and forth. I've developed this uh, particular presentation uh, from the standpoint of using either the PowerPoint presentation or, the, uh, or using uh, the, uh, my, uh, my uh, my talk without using a PowerPoint, so I can do it both ways, but I guess today I'll, I'll use both. So, um, and, uh, okay. so this is the same map, and uh, I grew up in uh, Rocky Mount, North Carolina. I grew up in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. It's about uh, an hour east of here. I guess most of you know where Rocky Mount other, you know, I found that there are a lot of people, so many people, not from North Carolina, in these various networking groups. But uh, I'm very familiar with North Carolina. I'm a Tar Heel. I grew up uh, in the state, not a North Carolina University of North Carolina Tar Heel, but as in a native of North Carolina. But at any rate, I grew up in Rocky Mount. I went to the public schools there, and uh, graduated from uh, high school. Uh, went off to uh, Durham. And uh, for those of you who cannot see this map because of its situation, I'm kind of turning around this way. Right? It's better the other way. This mm -hmm. way. Oh, it's no, better this way? Yeah. It's better this way? The TV's okay. No, the TV's okay. Okay. So anyway, I grew up in Rocky Mount, went to school in Durham, North Carolina. Got my undergraduate uh, education at North Carolina Central University. And uh, this is where I first was introduced to geography. Uh, and it was very interesting how I got uh, introduced to geography. And as a matter of fact, uh, the way I was introduced to geography uh, at North Carolina Central University is in this particular book here, which I'll talk about a little bit later. This is my most recent book, uh, Miracles in the Lives of Ordinary People. And then from North Carolina Central, got a bachelor's degree in geography and went off to uh, graduate school at uh, in Kansas, Kansas State University, as a matter of fact, uh, in Manhattan, Kansas, and uh, got a master's, came back, 
and uh, taught at my alma mater, North Carolina Central University, after two years of uh, working on a master's degree in geography. So I came back to uh, Durham to work at North Carolina Central as an instructor. And uh, then I left North Carolina Central and went to the University of Maryland at College Park to get a terminal degree in geography because in the uh, mid to late 70s, this is what you had to have in order to teach in any public institution in the University of North Carolina system. You had to have uh, a terminal degree in your area of specialty. And so I had to uh, go away and uh, went off to uh, Maryland uh, in uh, 1976, as a matter of fact. I believe uh, I was like uh, two years old or one. But anyway, I, uh, my family went to the uh, University of Maryland, got a degree, a uh, PhD ultimately in geography, and then came back to North Carolina, not to Durham, not to North Carolina Central, my alma mater, but to Elizabeth City. And uh, I worked in uh, Elizabeth City for 30 years teaching uh, geography and teaching earth science. And I also did quite a bit of writing. I did. Uh, peer review uh, articles, I did uh, grant proposals, uh, and I uh, was very successful in doing that. Uh, but uh, uh, in 19, or in 2010, I uh, decided to retire, and after all, it was 30 years, from 1979 to, 19, to 2009. So I retired in 2010, and uh, the interesting thing about retirement is that uh, I was wondering what exactly I was going to do in retirement. Fortunately, I was teaching online courses. Uh, the University of North Carolina system uh, gravitated toward online education, I would say, as early as the mid-1980s. So Elizabeth City State University, uh, as well as the other constituent institutions in the University of North Carolina system, uh, went in that direction, and I was a part of that. So even though I retired in 2010, I continued to uh, teach online courses. And uh, then after about three or four years, I stopped doing that. And so all of a sudden, I didn't have anything to do in particular. And so I was wondering exactly what I was gonna spend my time doing. I didn't want to be idle, and that's not a good thing in retirement or in any other stage. You need to have some objective and so uh, I thought about uh, being a greeter at Walmart. Uh, I thought about uh, being a substitute teacher. Uh, and uh, so anyway, I uh, thought about it and I said, well, I did a lot of writing uh, at Elizabeth City State University. And this is the, this is the university, Elizabeth City State University that I, uh, that, uh, that I worked for 30 years. And so I decided to uh, become a writer in 2000, about 2000. Is when I started uh, uh, becoming a writer and wrote my first book that I'll talk about in just a minute. And then, uh, since then, of course, I moved from Elizabeth City to Raleigh, and uh, that's where we reside now, uh, actually in Garner, right outside of Raleigh. And, uh, but I also uh, uh, took courses at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I took a couple of uh, geography courses. Uh, uh, while I was working at uh, North Carolina Central, as a matter of fact. And uh, so that's one reason why Chapel Hill is shown. But another reason why Chapel Hill is shown is because, even though I said earlier I'm not University of North Carolina Tar Heel necessarily, I like all the major institutions as well as minor institutions in the state. Um, so I'm a Duke fan as well, uh, as well as North Carolina Central University. And I see some of you are kind of turning. <laughs> It's at the sound of Duke. But anyway, I, I'm not partial. Uh, and, uh, but the point I want to make is that if you're familiar with sports, Michael Jordan, the great Michael Jordan, played at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And um, he delivered then Coach Dave Smith his first national championship back in 1982. And uh, of course, he went on to play professional basketball, and now he is the owner of the Charlotte. Hornets. And uh, so I put Charlotte on this map because me and my wife are season ticket holders for the Charlotte Hornets uh, uh, basketball team. And I just saw my, 
of the daughter, Pamela Foster. She would probably introduce herself in a minute. And, uh, and so uh, we're season ticket holders uh, uh, for the uh, Charlotte Hornets basketball team. And so this is a little bit of my personal background. So, uh, but what I'm here tonight uh, to uh, show you and to tell you about uh, the stories that uh, I write about. And as I said, since about 2014, I became uh, an author. And uh, you might ask the question, well, how did you become an author? Why did you uh, feel that you had a need or a desire to write? And this is my first book, by the way, uh, Life in the Spirit. And uh, one day, uh, we were at home, wife and I, and uh, so Panya came in, smiling, and I said, Panya, you must have had a good day today. And uh, she said, Dad, I gave out a gas out here on 440 about a mile and a half, what was it, a mile prior to the Glenwood Avenue exit, if you're familiar with the Raleigh going toward Crabtree. And if you're familiar with that particular area, there's a slight decline all the way down as you make that exit until you get to the service station about a half a mile down the road. But what happened, Pony indicated that to us, that I gave out a gas, I gave out a gas. Well, why are you so happy? And she contended that God helped her in her movement, in the movement of her vehicle from where she was on the belt line to that gasoline station. So I have her here tonight. <laughs> and I'd like for her just to say a word about exactly what happened, because I can't tell it as well as she could. I really can't. And this is the reason why I wrote, I got started writing the book. And as a matter of fact, it's the first chapter in the book. So Pony, do you want to take about a minute? Okay. So what had happened was, <laughs> my parents always told me not to drive on E, okay? So I learned my lesson for sure. So I'm going, 440 westbound, if you're familiar with, I lived off of Six Forks, focused on going to work. So 440 westbound going towards Glenwood Avenue. And you know, I don't know what it is now, but it's a tall high rise. It at well, one point was Howard Johnson's or Holiday Inn or something when I first moved here. But as you go down, for, as you um, go from Six Forks towards Glenwood Avenue, it's, there is an incline like my father spoke of, and it's like a curve. And you, uh, it's mostly traffic going to Crabtree at that point. But I get, I ran out of gas way before that that point. I mean, I had to have been halfway between the Glenwood Avenue exit and Six Forks. I knew I was out of gas because my car started making some funny movements. And then I look at finally look at my gas gauge and it's on E, and I'm like, oh my gosh, if I can just make it to that. At the time, it was a BP. It's right at the base of that high-rise hotel. And so I got a long ways to go, but um, with God and his, it, it was a miracle. I was out of gas on 440. As you roll down the hill, you know, you have, it's like four or five lanes at that point. You get to a stoplight, okay? I'm out of gas. I can't stop at the stoplight because I won't be able to accelerate enough to get to the gas station. So I'm just rolling. I mean, my car is rolling and I'm praying and I'm like, okay, I'm in trouble. I wasn't supposed to drive on E. I'm late for work. So many things went through my head. Well, my car rolled. Thank God no cars were coming, but I rolled past the stoplight. It was a red light. Hope there, there are no policemen in the house. But <laughs> rolled down there and my, I guess you're Maybe you don't know, but when you went out of gas, your steering wheel starts to lock up. So I am stirring. I didn't make it beyond the stoplight. Made it at that parking lot. And I really, that's the guy intervention because it gets kind of flat. So my heel is gravity is not pushing me down. I said, I'm, look, I'm a um, professional engineer. This, this, has, this, this science needs to work for me right now. So I'm turning the steering wheel really hard to steer. And I... I, I reenacted that for my father, actually. I don't think I was that close to the pump. I was a good ways away from the pump, but close enough to get the gas, to get the, um, the gas. 
and be able to go on to work. But that's a small miracle for me. A hard lesson learned. It could have been worse. I just feel like that was that was God. And my father loves that because he's like, I told you not to ride on E, so now you know. But that's my small miracle story. <laughs> Again, she can always tell that story much better than I could because uh, uh, she was in it. And, and really, it points to the fact that uh, all of us have gone through these extraordinary kinds of events, unusual kinds of events. We don't necessarily talk about them a lot, uh, and I guess we feel that it's really nobody else's business. Uh, but uh, it's kind of interesting, the work I do when I tell people that I, this is what I write about, a lot of times people are kind of, they open up and tell me some amazing things, things that I haven't really put in print. And of course I would never put anything in print without somebody's approval. But it's just amazing the kind of stories that you hear every day. Uh, uh, and I'm sure you all uh, have stories as well. And so, but anyway, this is the uh, reason why I, uh, I started writing uh, Life in the Spirit. Uh, this is the first of uh, 15 uh, stories in Life in the Spirit. And it's kind of interesting that, uh, and I'll go to the next frame. Um, it's kind of, can I do that? Tech support. Oh, okay. It worked. Um, it's, well, anyway, I, I wanted to get to something before I got to this particular frame. I was in the same predicament. I was a professor. If you look at the uh, after Panya's uh, poster, the next two posters, that's me, by the way, right there. Uh, I'll, I'll take these things. This is me. This was a number of years ago. Uh, I used to get these assigned inside. Was at this particular assignment, I was in Denver, Colorado on a mapping assignment, US Mapping Service, I believe it was. But anyway, to make a long story short, uh, I was coming out of uh, the, uh, my assignment uh, one day, going back to my rental house. And now, the, the traffic out of Denver is not quite this heavy, but it's pretty close. Denver is a pretty large city. If you can imagine, Capitol Boulevard, the traffic going in one direction instead of two directions on Capitol. Well, this is Denver, Colorado. And what happened was that on my way, going out from my assignment on this particular expressway, to make a long story short, uh, I was on the inside lane going out, but I gave out a gas. So I really couldn't get after the parking lot so much. But I gave out a gas. And uh, I was in a... Uh, a vehicle, a rental car as a matter of fact, because I drove from North Carolina to Denver in a van that I had at the time. Uh, but uh, that malfunctioned as well. And that's in the story. Uh, I think the story number six. But anyway, what happened was that I gave out a gas on my way back home and uh, I couldn't do anything, but the car stopped itself. It really did. It stopped itself because I was out of gas. So I got out of my vehicle, rose the uh, uh, hood up, and uh, just wondered what I was going to do next. I didn't know what to do. Have you ever been in these situations where you just don't know what to do? I mean, you just, you just can't think. But anyway, I, uh, my hood was raised. And after about four or five minutes, there was this person about five, four or five car vehicles behind my vehicle. And he got out, of, he was driving a station wagon. I remember that much. He got out of his station wagon and came toward me with a gasoline can. <laughs> now, I don't know whether it was a one-gallon gasoline can or a five-gallon gasoline can. This was a true story. Only after about four or five minutes, I was just flabbergasted. That was a service station about a quarter of a mile further up the road. But all this traffic, I didn't want to leave my valuables to go to the service station to get a, tra a gasoline can. And so I just didn't know what to do. But after about four or five minutes, this person got out of his station wagon with a gasoline can, came toward me and said, oh, I figured that you needed some help, and uh, I was wondering if you needed some gas. I believe that's what he said. I forget exactly what he did say. But anyway, I told him that I gave out a gas and I do need some gas. And so he was able to put the gasoline in my tank, and uh, after a few minutes, I was able to proceed to that gasoline station about a quarter of a mile further up the road. 
So it's kind of similar to uh, what what Panya what Panya. Which story came first? <laughs> <laughs> Who ran out of gas first? Like father, like. <laughs> well, again, this happened in 1986. Actually. Oh, okay. Uh, so this was uh, wow. Well, actually, it was when she was what maybe eight or nine years old. Maybe they were back in Elizabeth City. Remember, I said I worked in Elizabeth City for 30 years. They were back in Elizabeth City when I went out to uh, Denver. No, no cell phone. Uh, not in 1986. I don't think. But anyway, so that's another story in Light and the Spirit. Now, the only other story I'll tell you about, and by the way, there is another story involving my other daughter, Pamela, but I won't get into that. Now, that may be the most amazing story in the whole book. I mean, it, it was just amazing, and I won't, I won't ask her to, unless she really wants to. <coughs> I won't ask her to go. <laughs> but I will. Where are these? Was that trip back from college? Yeah. Uh, okay. I was just, uh, that's, that's a good one. Yeah, okay. well, yeah. I, I, I'll let you read this. Those of you who want to get the book, I'll let you read this. It's really an amazing story. But what is just amazing is uh, the story about when my brother, his name is James Earl, he teaches uh, Spanish action back down in Florida. But anyway, he was up one weekend. I think it was 2015, somewhere like that. And we went to the uh, Triangle Town Center, to the mall. He wanted to get some clothes, and so I went with him there. And we came back to uh, where we live in Garner. And on our way back, we were ready to cross this railroad crossing in Garner. If you're familiar with Garner at all, uh, just as you uh, go into White Oak, after you cross the railroad tracks. That's where this is. Go, uh, uh, White Oak is kind of further that way. So anyway, uh, what happened was that uh, I was driving my Prius. I just got my Prius vehicle. And uh, I was almost ready to cross the railroad crossing when all of a sudden I heard this sound from the left. And guess what? It was a train. And I was able to stop, fortunately, and I was about this far from the front end of my uh, Prius from the edge of the train and but I was able to throw on brakes stop the vehicle in a Prius you uh, can activate the uh, emergency brake simply by pushing a button and then whenever you activate the emergency brake of course you can take your foot off of the, the brake pedal and the car won't go anywhere but I'm not used to pushing a button having to activate an emergency brake. So I wasn't about to do that. My foot stayed on the brake pedal for about at least two or three minutes with the front end of my bumper about this far from the edge of the freight train. And you know, freight trains are long. It takes them forever to pass. And so it may have been even longer than that. But anyway, this is what happened. Uh, and we were able to uh, obviously live through that. That was a malfunction at this particular crossing, by the way. That's, that's what happened. Now, if you go that way, there's a light if you all familiar with that particular area. Did you say that you As a matter of fact, yeah. Um, about a month sorry. later, about a month later, someone lost their life. As a matter of fact, in Morrisville, I believe. I don't know, some of you may remember that. Mm -hmm. This couple tried to cross the uh, railroad and they didn't, they didn't make it. So this was a serious thing, it really was. But you have a lot of brush to the left, and so you can't see hardly anything to the left. And uh, before I knew anything, this train was coming in that direction. And so I had to throw on brakes. But what happened was that the crossing bar came down behind my Prius. And so I couldn't back up, and I couldn't move forward. I didn't want to move forward. And so I was in that position for about at least two or three minutes with my foot on the brake pedal. And it was just traumatic. Uh, my brother was sitting in the passenger seat, and he, it was probably he was probably worse off than I was because he didn't have any control of the situation. He could only hope that my foot stayed on the brake pedal. At least I had some control over the situation. So anyway, uh, we lived through that. Uh, after two or three minutes, the brake train passed, and and 
God, so we were able to go on home. Now, the biggest miracle, though, in my opinion, is the fact that uh, I wanted to do a story, and I did do a story of the train. That's what it's called. I think it's story 14 in this book, Life and Spirit. Um, but uh, I went out with that. In each chapter, I have as a lead into the chapter, just like the picture you saw of Anya at the gas pump, a picture leading into the, uh, into the chapter. And so that's what I wanted to do for this chapter. And so I went back to this crossing about uh, maybe a, a couple of weeks later, and I just wanted to take a picture. I knew this train, it was the five o'clock train coming from, I think, Smithfield going to Raleigh. So I knew it would cross this crossing uh, at about 5 o'clock, 5.30, something like that. And that's all I wanted to take was a picture of the train coming. Uh, and I would, uh, and I stood there, I think, about four or five, uh, it was about 20 or 30 minutes. But anyway, I finally saw the train coming, and I was able to take a snapshot of the train. Now, after maybe two or three days later, I, uh, upon closer examination of what I had taken, I learned... You all, some of you all can share. I learned that the uh, the vehicle was in the same. You all can share. You all can share. The vehicle was in the same predicament as I was in about three or four weeks later. You can pass these. Now that is truly amazing. Can you all see this? You can actually see, for one thing, you, do you see the crossing arm down behind this vehicle? Yeah. Yes. Where's this right oh, yeah, the red and white. Yeah, the little red and white. Yeah, the crossing arm is behind this vehicle. The vehicle, just prior to it getting to the track, with the train, you can see the uh, light oh, of the train <laughs> coming Ooh, that's from creepy. the left. <laughs> Now you tell me, what are the chances of me taking a picture of another vehicle in exactly the same situation that I was in about two or three weeks earlier? And totally unintended. I would have been happy with just the train going. But, but have, they, but, have they fixed the problem? They, well, they I'm have a the light. That this track. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they, they have a light there now. They do? Okay. They have a light there. Yeah. Oh, wow. That is crazy. So, out there okay, right? Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I, well, I was okay. there, so they, okay. they waited. But see, the interesting thing about this situation, it wasn't a freight train, it was a passenger train. Mm -hmm. You know, coming from Smithfield at 5.30, it was a passenger train. And it, it, it went by within a matter of 10, 15 seconds. So they didn't have to wait long. But the point is, is that it's amazing that I was able to take a picture of a vehicle in the exact same situation that we were in about Three or four weeks earlier. To me, that was that's sure. even a greater you miracle than you knew what they were feeling. Exactly. For the train being this far away. Well, after again, when I took the picture, I didn't realize that this was the case until about two or three days later. I said, wait, they're in the same predicament we were in. It's amazing. It's amazing. Now, where is uh, Molly? Because I know we want, is this a good time to take to a break with you all? Some things? I absorb think so. this. Amazing situation, and then I'll continue once we uh, once we come back.